Welcome back to your legends, I'm Dr. Cal, let's get right into this video. So the stock market closed up on all major indices, uh, S&P 500 up 0.3%, Nasdaq 0.4%, and the Dow 0.2%. Taking a look at the different groups, all of the different sectors closed in the green, with energy leading, followed by cyclicals, healthcare, and real estate. So we're seeing, a again, a rotation into inflationary sectors like energy, like real estate, like utilities. All of these sectors are very sensitive to inflation. And from a weak relative basis, energy has outperformed every other sector handily. Taking a look at the stock market map, we can see that yesterday uh, was a bit of a mild uh, trading sessions. We can see some green in energy, some in software application uh, companies, as well as solar. Facebook did okay, Disney, Netflix, uh, and Warner Brothers. So some of these entertainment and streaming companies. And some healthcare also did okay. Big cap tech like Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, as well as Tesla were flat, basically flat on the day. Now let's jump into the daily chart for the S&P 500. Again, we're starting to notice some very, very minor subtle changes that indicate that a reversal to the upside is coming. I did talk about this yesterday. We were, I, I think the, the first to uh, catch on to this when I noticed a very subtle but very important uh, divergence between the S&P 500 and the HYG, the high yield bonds, the junk bonds. Now, if you've been following my channel over the uh, last few weeks, you'd know that I've been talking a lot about the HYG. Both the HYG and the S&P 500 are considered high risk assets. And so they trade very similarly. The only difference is that uh, these are bonds and the S&P is made up of equities or stocks. And there's a very cliche saying that bond traders are smarter than stock traders. It is cliche, but it's also very true. In fact, those smart bond traders, that smart money, is what alerted us to the massive sell-off that we saw uh, earlier this week and late last week. I did talk a lot about these divergences that I spotted. Uh, every single time, really, we see, we've seen a top in the bear market rallies over the past about six to eight months. And every one of them uh, has led to a notable sell-off. Now, these divergences work both ways, guys. They work to mark uh, tops as well as bottoms. And uh, I did notice a very subtle uh, divergence yesterday on the one-hour chart. This divergence is now much more pronounced and it's obvious on the daily chart as well. In fact, let me add the S&P 500 to this chart so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Now, this chart above, guys, is the HYG, the high yield bonds, the junk bonds, and we can very clearly see a divergence where the high yield bonds are forming higher lows and higher highs as the S&P is forming lower highs and lower lows. This is a bottoming indicator, a leading bottoming indicator that indicates that this will be probably a minor bottom from which we will see an attempt to rally to the upside, probably to fill this gap right around here, which you can see much more clearly on the daily chart for the S&P, right around $422. Also supporting this thesis is the fact that the S&P 500 sold into the weekly expected move, the bottom of the weekly expected move, and really settled there for uh, a few trading days. And I did say, as soon as I saw that sell-off on Monday, that we should expect that the S&P 500 will try to reverse uh, from this level. Because when you see the weekly expected move hit on the very first day of trading, it is often the case that the S&P will try to reverse and go back to the middle of the weekly expected move. And look at that, it so happens to be at the exact same level at which we will fill this gap. A third additional point to support this thesis is the fact that the S&P 500, after making this massive move to the downside, is now looking for direction. And the reason that we're moving sideways is that we have the Jackson Hole Symposium on Friday and we have the GDP figures as well as the job numbers coming out uh, today. So it made a lot of sense from a fundamental economic point of view. It made sense that the, uh, the uh, S&P 500 will try to move sideways or chop around until we get a very clear directional move after Jackson Hole. It also made sense from a technical point of view because we hit the bottom of the weekly expected move 
as well as because I started to see those very sneaky divergences. Now, I did spot them yesterday, but now today they are way more pronounced and very obvious. And in fact, I've positioned myself, I freed some liquidity from my account to be able to trade a potential move to the upside over the next couple of days. If you guys want to follow my trades, I do post every single trade and investment in real time in the Discord group. It's 20 bucks a month. If you want to support me, that's the best way to do it. And I also post my strategies, my uh, trade ideas, and my interpretation of the different economic data. Basically, all of my uh, trading and investment activity is in the uh, Discord trading community. You are very welcome to join. And I do have a 25% discount for the annual membership. You get 25% off if you uh, sign up for the annual membership. Now, let's jump into the triple Qs. Again, we're seeing a divergence, a very clear divergence between the triple Qs and the uh, HYG. Again, the HYG is putting in higher lows while the triple Qs are putting in lower lows. We're also seeing a very subtle shift in the look of the candles, right? This was a massive bearish candle, full-bodied uh, red candle. This had a, a reversal candle, a high, a long wick, and a very narrow body. And this is another reversal candle, right, with half of the length of the candle being the body and half being the wick. Now, these types of candles, guys, do uh, signal reversals. And the way to interpret them is that the first attempt was trying to test the move to the upside. The second attempt tried to test the move to the upside and managed to close above yesterday's move. So we're seeing more bullishness into the price action, pour into the price action. And that's how you would interpret these uh, candles. Also, guys, as a rule of thumb, when you see a narrow body candle with long wicks to either side, this is a an indecision candle or a reversal candle. And the way to interpret these candles as a rule of thumb is that if you see them at the top of a trend, they indicate a reversal to the downside. When you see them at the bottom of a trend, they indicate a reversal to the upside. But you need to correlate these uh, candlestick patterns with other indicators like uh, the PPO, the MACD, uh, different oscillators, as well as different divergences. And you have to line that up with the fundamentals. So you have to look at all of the above, everything. You can't just go by uh, candlesticks. You can't just go by oscillators. You can't just go by the fundamentals. You have to put all of those things together to have the best chance at success to improve your win rate for different trades. Over the past couple of weeks, uh, we've been on a roll in the trading group. We've been uh, we've been on a really nice winning roll, knock on wood. Fingers crossed that that winning streak continues. Uh, but so far, the market has been fairly easy to read over the last couple of weeks. We did see this massive sell-off come in. We did see this reversal at the bottom. We're now seeing a reversal to the upside. So far, the technicals have been playing out beautifully for us. This does not always happen. This is not always the case. Uh, sometimes you cannot get a very clear directional move, but so far it's been going really nicely for us. Uh, now, another trick that I want to show you guys is the RSP. The RSP, guys, is the S&P 500 Equal Weight ETF. And what that means, guys, is that this ETF is made up of the S&P 500 companies with each company assigned an equal weight regardless of the market cap of the company, while the S&P 500 ordinary uh, ETF assigns a percentage of the ETF that corresponds to the market cap of the company. For example, because Apple is so much larger than ExxonMobil, for example, the S&P 500 ordinary ETF, the, the SPY, will have a larger weighting of Apple compared to ExxonMobil. You don't see that with the equal weight ETF. You see an equal weight of all the S&P 500 components. And the trick is here, guys. You can use the RSP or the equal weight ETF as somewhat of a sneaky indicator to try and figure out if the market is going risk on or risk off. And the way to do that is you would look at the move in the RSP and in a risk on move. Typically, you will see the equal weight ETF outperform the SPY. And that did happen yesterday. We had a half percentage point move to the upside on the equal weight ETF. And then on the SPY, we had a 0.32% a, uh, move to the upside. Again, this is another indicator that there's some risk appetite coming back in. 
Not only that, but the candles are also starting to look slightly more different. This last candle for yesterday, for Wednesday, is more full-bodied than the spy candle. It's a very subtle difference, but it is there. Now, the reason that I like this trick is that it gives you fewer uh, false signals than doing it based on the Russell 2000. Uh, you can do this uh, same trick with the Russell 2000. You'd look at the Russell 2000, and if it's outperforming the SPY, usually it means that the market is risk on. But the problem with that is that the Russell 2000 is made of completely different components than the S&P 500. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Some people uh, like to like to use it. I like to use it, but I also prefer the RSP, the equal weight ETF. So that's one. Uh, so that's one more arrow in your uh, quiver of tricks to try and beat the market. Now let's take a look at the VIX. Again, we spotted this beautiful, beautiful signal right back here when we saw this crossover. I warned everybody that this is the strongest sell signal in all of the uh, sell signal indicators that I follow. Not only does it have a 100% track record year to date of catching every single sell off and every single top in the market, it is also a fairly easy signal to spot. So I added the S&P 500 to this chart so you can guys see what I'm talking about. The, uh, the first time we saw this signal was back here in November and this marked the top in the NASDAQ. Uh, the S&P 500 top did not come until later, but we did have a sell-off right here in January among the top in the S&P 500 and the beginning of a new bear market. We had a massive sell-off. Right here in February, it marked the top. We had that sell-off. Right over here in April, it also marked the top and we had a sell-off. Right here in June, it marked the top and we had the sell-off. Right here in August, just last week, it marked the top perfectly and we had a sell-off. Now, I want to show you guys how I line these vertical lines up and it's through this PPO indicator. I look at the very bottom of the PPO reading. I put a line over there and... I wait for a bullish crossover on the PPO, and this serves as the confirmation for uh, this signal. Unfortunately, earlier in uh, in uh, July, we did get a lot of false signals here, right? We had one here, another one right over here, another one right over here. But if you notice, we did not see a bullish crossover on any one of these. So make sure not to front run the signal. I did front run it earlier in July and it ended up not panning out. I, so I completely stopped front running this signal and now I wait for the confirmation. Now let's take a look at the dollar index, the DXY. The DXY is now forming a bull flag, a very, very clear bull flag, right? So watch for a break above this upper resistance line for the sell-off to continue in the S&P 500 and the rest of the equity market. Now, I did talk a lot about the DXY over here, and I was watching for a break above 107, and as soon as we had that, right over here, uh, the DXY, really the dollar index, did not look back, and it ripped to the upside, and it led to a sharp, sharp sell-off in the S&P 500. We're now flagging. This is allowing the stock market to float back up, at least momentarily, at least temporarily, now, I do plan to play the move to the upside on the S&P 500, but be very careful here, guys. This, unfortunately, will end up trapping so many people. A lot of people will go back into the S&P thinking that this is just a pullback and to buy the dip again. And unfortunately, this will lead to so many people blowing up their accounts, losing so much money. So please just be careful if you want to play this trade. The way that I'm planning to do that is to do it very short term to manage my uh, positions very actively. Stop losses, taking profits, all of that stuff. Now, let's take a look at Apple. Again, Apple is seeing uh, a bunch of reversal signals, a bunch of reversal candles. We had an indecision candle right here, another one right here. If we see a nice big green candle, this will end up making what we call a morning star uh, candlestick pattern and that's when you have one long wicked candle that looks like this followed by a directional move to the upside and the psychology behind this candlestick pattern guys is that the uh, price was rejected to the downside bulls took over pushed it all the way to the upside and the next day 
when you see a confirmation to the upside, a push to the upside, this is called a morning star can uh, candlestick pattern, and it's very, very bullish. But again, you need to correlate this uh, pattern with a lot of other indicators. And again, it is occurring at a very logical level, this 20-day moving average. So there's probably a nice little trade to the upside over the next couple of trading sessions. Medium term, I am still very bearish on Apple. I think this move to the upside from the June lows right at right to the top was 35%. It's absolute insanity. We tend to see Apple significantly outperform the market in the depth of bear markets. This happened in 2008. Unfortunately, this outperformance lasts for just a few months. And eventually it ends up cracking to the downside, losing all of that outperformance in a matter of a few weeks. And unfortunately, that's when a lot of people who uh, decided to hide an Apple end up losing so much money. So I do not like Apple as a long trade at these levels for so many reasons, technical reasons, fundamental reasons, market dynamic reasons, economic, macroeconomic reasons, so many reasons why this trade is very risky at the top from a long perspective. Now let's take a look at Tesla. Tesla completed the split today. It is 6 a.m. Eastern time as of the time of recording this video. So the split is complete. Uh, the uh, three for one split on Tesla. So, so be careful here, guys. What tends to happen around a stock split, guys, is that we see relative strength leading to the split. And then that relative strength loses all of the steam after the split. So be careful at these levels here, guys. I did like uh, this dip into the demand zone and the bounce back up. I also did like that the fact that we never got back uh, deep into this demand zone and we're seeing a move back to the upside. But again, from a fundamental point of view, a, a split does not change anything, okay? It just adds some technical strength, relative strength leading into the split. And often uh, these stocks lose all of that steam after the split. So just be careful around these levels, manage your risk accordingly. Now let's take a look at oil. Oil continues to see strength. A lot of people have been calling for oil to go all the way down to $65 right here. Now, I, 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 was, I sort of thought these people were crazy. I still kind of think they're crazy for so many reasons. These are really smart people that think this will happen, okay? The, the really smart people, it's people who I look up to. Uh, it's, I'm talking about really famous people on YouTube. Okay. Really big trading, uh, channels. I just, I, I just don't buy this at all. And it's, it's for fundamental reasons more, more than anything. I think inflation will continue to be strong primarily because, uh, be, because the U S has such a massive, massive debt burden and the fed simply cannot for political reasons, raise rates enough to really combat inflation. Remember, over the past 50 plus years, since the 70s, the Fed has never, never been able to beat inflation, to move inflation back down to trend without the federal funds rate sitting at a percentage point higher than the CPI. And the CPI is sitting at roughly eight and a half as of right now. And even if that inflation rate gets cut in half and we sit at, let's say, four and a half, the Fed does not even want to go above 4%. It's guiding for a terminal rate around 3.8%. And this is why you're seeing the inflation trade uh, getting more steam. Market participants simply believe, and rightly so, that the Fed is incompetent and that it will not be able to control inflation. And I happen to agree, not necessarily because the Fed is incompetent, basically because the Fed, because the Fed is going to be politically forced not to raise rates enough to kill inflation. From a technical point of view, guys, I was also seeing this very obvious divergence. We had uh, the PPO forming a higher low while the stock, while the price of oil was forming a lower low. This was a bullish divergence. We now have this very beautiful double bottom with a break to the upside. Global oil supplies continue to be tight. Uh, uh, Russia will continue to tighten the supply and cut it off uh, oil and, and gas and cut that off from uh, Europe. So unfortunately, we are heading into an energy crisis. We're basically already in an energy crisis. And in these environments, in high inflation environments, oil 
energy in general tends to be the best performer in the entire stock market. And here today, energy has been the best performer. So uh, we're seeing this secular change, the secular uh, shift into energy leading again after it has been losing uh, really to tech companies for over 20 years. Now, this brings me to ExxonMobil, my favorite oil company, the Apple of energy. I, I was talking uh, about this massive bull pennant for a few weeks now. I did say to watch for a break above this uh, resistance line. And look at that. Look at this beautiful, absolutely beautiful breakout. As soon as we broke above, not only did we break above, we uh, gapped up and we continued to rip. So we had a gap and rip. And fortunately, uh, the trading uh, community and I caught this really early on at $96, uh, and we caught this move to the upside. I really like uh, this trade. I think there's a lot more upside left in it. Now, I did exit this position to take profits and to prepare uh, myself for this move to the upside on the S&P, where I believe over the next couple of, uh, couple of days, we'll see the S&P probably outperform energy. So uh, I, I am planning to take advantage of that and get and then uh, jump back into ExxonMobil. So this is a core position for me and I'm just trading around it. Okay, if that makes sense. Now we've been trading beautifully within this uh, bullish channel, this uptrend. And if we just simply track the middle of this channel going into, let's say, the uh, beginning of next year, you can expect that ExxonMobil will uh, close at $110 by January. This is a very conservative, conservative estimate because the uh, the price can easily uh, trade back into this uh, red range, uh, this upper uh, edge of the uh, trading channel. So uh, so all the way from 110 to 120 to even $130 uh, by the beginning of next year. Now let's take a look at the fear and greed reading. We're still sitting at a neutral reading. We did not see a test of the fear reading. I, I talked a lot about this uh, fear and greed reading uh, topping at 58. I, I said uh, watch for a top at 58. We topped at 57. This greed reading topping at 58 was critical for this bear market thesis to be valid and we topped at 57. So we're still uh, squarely in a bear market with greed uh, forming lower lower highs. Market momentum, uh, we pulled back to the 125 daily moving average. The last time we did that, we saw a bounce back up. This again lends credence to what I'm saying uh, to my thesis that we're, we'll probably see a, a, uh, a bounce back up. The divergences are indicating that we will see that. Uh, the, the weekly expected move, now the uh, 125 daily moving average. So a bunch of things are lining up for a slight move back to the upside. Watch for a double top. Watch for a res uh, watch for a rejection at this um, gap. Watch for a rejection at the top of this uh, resistance line. Uh, so we can see rejection at uh, really at any at any point here. It could come really early at the uh, at the uh, gap fill level. It could come in slightly higher than that. Me personally, if we see a gap fill, I'll be taking profits at the gap fill level. I, I try to trade these counter trend rallies very very conservatively because you can go from a 50% profit to a 50% loss really in, in, a, in a matter of, of a day. We could see a gap fill and a complete reversal to the downside the next day or a gap down uh, where you are left holding the bag. Please do not be left holding the bag. Take profits, manage risk. Back to the fear and greed. Price Beth continues to collapse. Put to call options. I did say watch for a, a slight nudge back down. We're starting to see that. I also said that market volatility often sees a uh, rejection or uh, a resistance at the 50-day moving average before continuing to move to the upside. Here on the VIX, guys, every single time we had this uh, this massive sell signal, we had this brief uh, move to the upside and then a reversal, a, a short-term reversal be before that massive sell-off came. Look at that. Boom, 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 boom. This was the only time where we, don't, we, where we did not see a uh, pullback before we continue to sell. Even here we said we had that uh, pullback and then we continue to sell. So we had this very quick spike in volatility. We're now seeing it subside slightly. Watch for a pullback to 21 and a half to 22, just about for volatility to spike back up. Safe haven demand uh, and uh, junk bond demand. Haven safe haven demand is growing. Uh, bonds are outperforming stocks. Junk demand is uh, now declining in favor of investment. Investment grade bonds. 
Now let's take a look at the economic calendar. Today we have the jobs numbers coming in an hour before the market open and the GDP revision watch. Watch for a revision to the upside. This will be bullish. Watch for jobs to come in strong. This will also be bullish. And tomorrow we'll have the dreaded, dreaded PCE inflation figure. We have consumer sentiment. We have five-year inflation expectations. And we have consumer spending and personal income. And we have J-PAL, the manipulator in chief, coming in at 10 a.m., likely to crash our stocks. Now, the way to trade uh, around these massive economic events is uh, for us guys to watch what happens on the day of the event and for confirmation the day after. So we can see a, a move to the upside today, possibly let's say to 420 or something like that. We might see some bullishness today, especially if that GDP figure comes in bullish. And then on Friday, we could see a massive, massive rip to the upside, even as Jay Powell goes out to speak. And unfortunately on Monday, we could see a complete reversal really destroying everybody that got in uh, and FOMO'd in at the top here. So be very careful. Watch for confirmation on Monday. Do not, uh, do not rush into things. Do not FOMO into things. That's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, wow.